Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm equally honored to be invited here. Um, and I have my works uh, in uh, forensic odontology for quite a while, uh, only as a dental consultant. And I'm learning a lot from uh, the previous speakers. And I, for sure, I will be staying until the end because I want to learn more. OK, so this is a general practitioner's perspective. Uh, although uh, in the past 20 years, I've been uh, inclined to prosthodontics. So still, it's a uh, away from uh, a full-time uh, forensic odontology work. But nevertheless, let me share with you some of the experiences I have and also the challenges and problems that I met. I hope you like this. The year of my graduation is 1986. So in about 10 years after my graduation, there come a big disaster fire in Manila, in Quezon City, which, which, in, which involves um, a, a party place. The place is known as Ozone Disco. Uh, it went to fire, it was ablaze on March of 1996. This is the season where uh, young people would go to party places to celebrate their uh, coming graduation. March and April is the graduation time for uh, our country. So there are lots of uh, people enjoying and celebrating on these dates. On that night, there were 350 guests from, uh, as reported from the newspaper. And all of a sudden, um, a spark from a ceiling started caused by some electrical uh, malfunctions. And nobody noticed it, or some people and guests have noticed it, but they discounted this as part of uh, uh, the gimmick. So they continued their celebration until the fire engulfed the entire place. Uh, they all rushed to one exit, only one exit, and it has swing door. Unfortunately, it was designed swinging from the outside inside. So people from the inside rushing, all people rushing out, cannot swing the door to gain access to the outside of the building. That's why a lot of the, the dead people, the dead uh, bodies were found near the exit door, right? So this is the biggest disaster, fire disaster in our country that have been, been recorded. There are 162 uh, people who, who perished on that night. And then on December 1998, that's barely two years from that incident, another fire occurred in uh, an orphanage in Manila, Asociación de Damas Filipinas Orphanage. There are 70 people inside. Again, it's nighttime and they're supposed to be resting and uh, uh, sleeping. There are 70 people, including children and infants. This is a house where uh, not all of the children are orphaned because it is a place where uh, transient um, uh, infants and uh, children can be accepted because their parents or their mothers are working at daytime. That, that night, 27 uh, people occupying the building perished, most of them children and infants who were in the nursery. This is a picture I've taken from the internet and it depicts the picture of a mother who has gone from work. Uh, at night, he's going, she's going to visit her child only to find out that his child or her child had perished. And in November 20, uh, 2000, November 2000, there was this celebrated case. It's no longer a fire. Uh, a celebrated uh, case because uh, this is a case of a double murder. Uh, the guy is supposed to be a very, very popular PR man for politicians, uh, was, went, uh, went missing along with his driver and they could not find the body until uh, uh, in a nearby province or town, 
there was this site where uh, some remains of uh, cremated bodies, crudely cremated bodies were found. And I was again invited to take a look of the evidence, uh, the specimens that were found there. One of them is the partly molten framework of a partial denture, with, which uh, contains an imprint of the brand of the metal, which was very popular in the Philippines. And we know that uh, that brand was ex is exclusively used by one laboratory in Manila and in uh, nearby provinces. So we went to that laboratory, hoping against hope that a record of the work authorization or the job order of the dentist would be there. And luckily we found it and we identified the dentists who were uh, doing the work, dental work for uh, the guy and the driver. And uh, that helped identify the, the remains. But it's a murder case. So therefore, a uh, few people were uh, apprehended and questioned and actually incarcerated, but they are considered small fishes because they are looking until now, the mastermind of this uh, brutal uh, murder still runs free. Okay, so the work that I have been with in, in connection with forensic activities is like a dental consultant. It actually started in 1996 when that fire of a, a party place uh, happened and a friend who is a medical pathologist, also uh, a uh, faculty member in the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines, Manila, uh, approached me to, uh, to help her with uh, identification. So that was the start. Uh, cases that they, they handle is actually, I, want, I became part of uh, the informal team. We, we call ourselves the UP, uh, that's University of the Philippines Forensic Team. And that medical pathologist, a doctor, is our head. And we also have members with us who are uh, DNA experts. The university in Quezon City has this DNA analysis machine. So we also have anthropologists, entomologists, and toxicologists, pharmacologists, etc. So it's actually a team. So therefore, I am a member of this as the dental practitioner. And then another affiliation that I have is the Philippine Dental Association Team for Forensic Odontology. Uh, I'm a, the chair of this uh, uh, team, and we hope to uh, to have a we, have, we are we are gearing for uh, more aggressive plans for. Uh, organization of all the dentists in the country, but unfortunately the pandemic happened. So uh, the activity has to be placed into a halt. But we are determined to continue with this and uh, we expect uh, this to happen and coordinate with all the practicing, practice, practicing dentists, including those dentists in the police uh, department or the Philippine National Police and also the National Bureau of Investigation, as well as the Armed Forces of the Philippines. We are starting with that until uh, the pandemic happened. In my journey to uh, a very um, interesting, scary, uh, uh, full of anxiety, but rather enjoyable because we were able to help people and we were able to answer legal questions. We help uh, su uh, supply information using our uh, uh, knowledge in dentistry and technology. Uh, that's kind of makes us proud to be of help to promote justice and the basic precepts of uh, human rights. So, Almost all of my uh, experiences uh, involves identification of dead remains, uh, sex determination and age estimation is of course a part of it because uh, this can lead to uh, identification uh, later on. 
Uh, and then we also, I also happen to do some age estimation uh, for not only for dead remains, but also for young children who doesn't have uh, birth registration and needed the certification of uh, uh, an expert or the dentist to uh, put the issue of age. Of course, like all other speakers have, uh, uh, spoke in, uh, before me, uh, the evidence says uh, a lot of things is dependent on the antemortem information and the antemortem, uh, most antemortem uh, items or elements depends on how the dentist would do a dental record, an accurate dental record of all his patients. And there are a few in, uh, that are involved uh, analysis of uh, bite marks, specifically uh, related to uh, maltreatment, child abuse, and also sexual assault. And of course, identification of some of the parts that are found in the, uh, where the remains would, would, would be. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. He, uh, Dr. Pandey, the difficulty of uh, identifying which one is a dental structure or a bony structure and the burned uh, remains or burned debris. That's a part and parcel of uh, the first problem, the initial problem that we have. This is not a complete list, but this is at least more or less my, my uh, involvement in being a consultant for forensic activities. So as a practitioner, how do I go about doing that? So I rely on my expertise, uh, modesty aside. Dentists are supposed to be experts. And we are experts in terms of subjects like oral anatomy and physiology, a sound principle of our knowledge in principles of oral surgery and pathology. I'm sure nobody will argue with that. And then we have a particular uh, attention and interest in the development, growth and age changes in the teeth and also the uh, surrounding structures. And of course, we cannot be a good dentist without knowledge, excellent knowledge of dental materials and the technology. Uh, Every dentist should be experts in dental materials. Maybe the last one here in this list, the application of that knowledge and the specialized techniques to use, to be used to extract this uh, evidences and findings is, none, is not really expected of a dentist. So I have to learn it the hard way with the help of uh, my informal team, specifically the medical pathologist who's, guide, who's guided me on what to look for and what is more useful and what is applicable. So uh, I, I learned it, I, I don't have a formal training. I learned it, so to speak, in the streets. In addition to, to the, list, the listed uh, expertise there, um, I have also this at first difficulty in preparing my findings, presenting the findings as well in a manner that will be useful to answer a legal question that is being posed. And of course, every professional, the last one is flexibility, open-mindedness and willingness to learn. I think professionals have this quality and attribute. So I rely on this expertise. But I'm aware, I'm aware that there are other sources of evidences and sources of uh, identifiers. And this is again, not a complete list. Uh, maybe it's worth mentioning some identification documents left in the body. Of course, it, it's, uh, if it's still available, nobody uh, came in earlier than the investigators. I, I, know, I know you know what I mean. And then facial recognition. I think uh, Dr. Pandey had mentioned this. Facial recognition by relatives and close friends and families would be also be a source of evidence. Fingerprints, of course, is a uh, very uh, uh, trusted way of uh, being uh, able to identify a person. And of course, the measurements, the parameters that as a, uh, can, offer, can be offered by uh, 
anthropology or experts in anthropology, presence of uh, prosthesis in the body, inserts maybe. Now we have the implants, dental implants. It's a very uh, uh, good source of uh, identifier, unique identifier, and uh, tattoos and other marks, and also personal belongings, again, if they are still available, including clothes or pieces of clothing. Uh, in the fire of the ozone disco, there are lots of uh, uh, victims who were uh, who whose clothing remains attached to the uh, burnt skin that helped in the uh, positive identification. Okay, so like anyone else involved in uh, forensic and specifically forensic odontology. Uh, when I examine the um, specimen, I look for uniqueness in the features, like peculiarities or abnormalities. And then I take note of that. E even in the absence of a antemortem dental records, I am, going, I am preparing a postmortem dental record. I also examine the status of the teeth. In fact, the, uh, the entire uh, dental arch and if there are presence of restorations, intracoronal restorations, uh, what type of restorations? Uh, is it amalgam or a composite or whatever? And then I also needed to uh, examine and analyze the development of teeth for possible uh, age estimation. And an x-ray examination and analysis would also be helpful. I, I have done a lot of this. There are a few cases in bite marks analysis I have said earlier. And dentures. Uh, if dentures are present, dentures will be uh, uh, examined in terms of the type, materials, and status. If the denture is not present, and if the family would supply a denture, we, we, I, I, was, I was ready to to uh, fit it in the, the dead body. So I remember this one, one case where the, the victim has two dentures, one he's wearing when, when he perished and the other one was left in the, in the house. So that helped a positive uh, comparison and positive identification. And of course, the vital role of the available dental records. I'd like to share with you some of these things that uh, we have, I have been participated in. Like in 2009, there's this uh, in the hospital, that's the child protection unit of uh, the hospital. It's known as the Philippine General Hospital, part of UP Manila. Uh, a brief story is that this 11 year old girl uh, did not went, did not go home at not, uh, when he, uh, after an errand at about nine o'clock p.m. and he's gone missing, and they found his body in the grasses, no clothes, uh, but still alive, fortunately. And when she was examined, part of uh, the dental examination revealed this uh, bite marks. Yeah, close up. Uh, photo of that. <clears throat> There's another one there at the side of the abdomen there, pointed by the arrow. And then uh, there, that's a close up picture of that. And also near the thigh. And on the other side, which is much more painful, I guess. There's cover around. The, uh, the uh, perpetrator of the crime was apprehended. Uh, he was uh, he's gone uh, some uh, court procedures, but a few weeks later on, he was reported to have been killed by uh, the, in the jail in the jailhouse. So I will not be dealing in detail of that. So. I don't know if uh, that would be considered justice has been served. I don't know. 
Okay, like uh, the other speaker talk about the intraoral scanner, really uh, where I am as a general practitioner, not only as a general practitioner in making dentures, you know, uh, making impressions without uh, dealing with impression materials, uh, I was very excited. And we also uh, reckon the use of this in record keeping. So, and also in uh, anti-mortem uh, uh, record preservation. So these are just pictures from uh, the internet that I have collected. And I think we know how it looks. And then uh, this can be printed, 3D printed to have a uh, hard uh, copy of uh, that. Before the advent of this uh, equipment, we had to uh, make impressions of the arches. Uh, our team had to make impressions of the arches. Uh, in fact, we had one one time we had to uh, make a full impression of the skull, showing all the parts and also the teeth. Uh, and we had a very difficult time doing that, making it into a stone or a gypsum model. Uh, but now we're very happy that this this uh, equipment and technology is available. So that to save us a lot of uh, difficulty and trouble preserving the evidences or the pictures or the, the specimen. You see that uh, we cannot hold on to uh, the dead remains for a long time because there's, a, I'm sure in all countries, there are laws that regulates keeping of uh, dead uh, bodies. So we have to find a way how to continue with the investigation after we the body has been returned. And of course, the CBCT scan, as, there, as was uh, discussed and uh, uh, advised by uh, Dr. Eddie, I think. Uh, so very useful. Okay, what are the challenges? Uh, well, well uh, the challenges that uh, Dr. Sande um, had, had uh, mentioned really is, it is quite true and very realistic. So I would not be going into that. In fact, I also include that in this uh, presentation. But upon hearing her, I, I decided that to include it. And uh, I decided to include those that I think is more, to me, more a problem of politics and uh, culture. All right. So number one here is institutional pride. Somebody mentioned about the, the, the police uh, department uh, wanted to do their own. They do not want to be uh, uh, working with other people. They have their own ways of doing things and so on. Uh, our military, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, has the same uh, uh, sense of you know, working and also the National Bureau of Investigation. That is what I refer to as institutional pride. It's okay if they can do the job well and if the purpose of what they're doing can, can be served right. But the thing is, some of us, like me, myself, my team, is not a member of the armed forces. We are not members of the Philippine National Police, nor a member of the National Bureau of Investigation. And if the families, for example, wanted our services to be uh, to 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 be contacted, then we we have no way of uh, penetrating that investigation. So we will be cordoned off. So that's the that's the challenge that uh, one thing that I have experienced. And then of course, everybody would agree that the absence of dental records, the two, two things that I'm talking about here, the absence because there's no one who, come up, who, who can come up with a record. Either uh, the family doesn't know that the dentist of the, the disease, uh, who the dentist of the disease is or whatever reason, or simply there was no dental records that have been done, or maybe the victim has not seen a dentist at all. So the absence of dental records is really a problem. Sometimes dental records are present, but they are poorly accomplished. So this is uh, mentioned already by the past speakers. Uh, next uh, slide, I, I give you a, an example of uh, 
the actual experience that I have with this uh, item. And this is a problem that uh, the Philippine Dental Association team would like to address also. Like if, for example, a patient who has a record, dental record in uh, Manila, went up to uh, the province to have a dental treatment, maybe it's an emergency extraction or whatever, and then the, the record may be kept there, the sole entry attending to the transient need. And then uh, if it's extraction, for example, if some, something happened to that patient, the record that can be uh, supplied was the original record with still the extracted tooth in the province still there. And that can change all the, the data that we can be collected. So there has to be a system by which uh, dental records can be consolidated uh, throughout the country, maybe throughout, throughout uh, anywhere. But we will be dealing with uh, maybe some things like uh, the legal impediment, like uh, uh, we get it, uh, Privacy Act, and so on. This is one thing that uh, may be to be addressed also by those people who will be assigned to uh, collect, handle, and preserve the specimens in a crime scene. I think they are improving, but uh, some, some are inadvertent, but some are intentional, I guess. So some interested parties might want to uh, bungle the investigation to mislead the, the investigation. Sometimes they are mutilated, the remains are mutilated. Like I will, I will show you a, a case where the hands and fingers were cut off not part of uh, uh, the alleged, uh, well, maybe it's a murder, but then the, the perpetrators uh, for sure did the intentional mutilation to avoid uh, identification of the dead. The, uh, the intention may be you know, to bungle with the investigation and uh, maybe it's a uh, motivated by by uh, self-interest, etc. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is a uh, news clipping from the internet. <clears throat> Sometime in uh, uh, 2020, this is uh, the pandemic time. No? A uh, very controversial uh, retired justice of the Department of Justice has been reported missing and then the uh, body was found uh, somewhere in the north of Manila, province north of Manila, where the missing left fingers and right hand is mutilated. Right? This uh, uh, former justice uh, have been tested, DNA tests have been conducted, and the Bureau of Investigations of the NBI has declare, declared that uh, DNA was much 99.99%. So therefore they declared that uh, the guy, uh, the dead body was indeed the guy. So therefore the identification process had been impacted by this news, including my own investigation. I was also requested by my colleague to help in the investigations of the antemortem and the postmortem picture. This is an example of what we gathered from a dental record. Looks good, looks good, but wait till you see what's inside. That is part of uh, what we found. Uh, it's dated 2011, all right? So there, 2011 there. Uh, to help us see a little bit uh, better, 
I will, uh, I have cut that, I crop that picture uh, there. The, the, the procedures are listed here. The number of tooth is here. Uh, this one, uh, don't, don't uh, be surprised, we did this so that the prices will not be seen. Our copy, we did this, the prices. The inputs on the records primarily dwell with the prices, right? So let's take a look at the other pages of this record. There, the record was updated January 2018. Please take note that there are records here. Tooth number 14, that's the right first premolar, and tooth number 15, the right second premolar, were extracted. And there's some procedures done there on a particular tooth. OP is a prophylaxis, right? And then there's another extraction here, tooth number 27, that's left upper second molar and another one tooth number one seven the uh, the right first uh, the right uh, the upper right uh, second molar let's take a look at the post-mortem record we are lucky to have the pictures there you go it's supposed to be him all right uh, take a look i want you to focus your attention on this tooth here this is one seven all right Badly carious, but it's there. And also one four there. Let's take a look at the lingual area. That's far more clear. That's two seven. Uh, I mean one seven, and that's one four. Remember that the record showed one four missing because it was extracted supposedly in 2019, 2018. And the other one on that quadrant was also reported extracted, one seven. And please remember also that the record says two seven was also extracted. So therefore, where is tooth number two seven? It's right here. Let's take a closer picture right there. That's the first, the, the place where the first molar is, second molar, 27, 26, 27, 28, this has been probably post mortem loss. But, but this is the, the tooth that was being reported to be extracted. Now, I, so, you know, I understand if uh, some findings may not uh, harmonize or may not be harmonized, uh, but it is it's, it's to understand that uh, if uh, the records would show a tooth that is existing and in the post-mortem it shows that it's no longer there and that can be explained maybe it was uh, extracted somewhere or not the, the same dentist or not recorded and so on but this time it was recorded that it was extracted in 2018 and the post-mortem shows that the teeth are still there so this is again my again my my greatest the, qu the questions for some time make me sleepless at times. No? So if I will be uh, examined as a skeleton, maybe I would look like this, but, uh, wondering and not too happy maybe. I look smiling because in the absence of the lips. Okay, my, la my last few slides, I'd like to tell you this is, this is some, some sort of a disclaimer because in my participation and working in trying to help in answering some legal questions, finding the truth, I do not consider myself an expert nor a specialist in forensic science. I only act as an expert in the science of dentistry and technology. And I could, and this, this is my humble contribution to the efforts of forensic odontology. Thank you so much and good afternoon.